Imagine a bustling city where millions of people go about their daily lives, relying on their smartphones, laptops, and other devices to stay connected to the world. Behind the screens and powerful processors lies the unsung hero, the microchip. These tiny marvels, no larger than a grain of sand, are the lifeblood of our modern world, enabling everything from social media updates to life-saving medical technologies. Taiwan silently produces around 92% of the world's most advanced microchips, powering the devices we rely on every day. The microchip industry is a blessing for the island's $760 billion economy, but only 130 kilometers away from Taiwan's shores lies the island's biggest problem, the People's Republic of China. China sees Taiwan as a de facto province and expertly seeks to annex the island including this billion-dollar microchip industry. But Taiwan is holding a stance against what apparently is the island's biggest enemy. What happens if Taiwan says no to China and declares independence? The semiconductor industry is inarguably one of the most silent wealth generators in the world. Until recently, only a few people understood what this quiet industry is about. Even the world's largest microchip producer is relatively unknown, and could easily have been the biggest company in the world with little recognition. Interestingly, this relatively unknown company has a market share of $322 billion, which puts it way ahead of popular companies companies like Sony and Samsung. TSMC, known fully as the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, is the only company on the planet that enjoys absolute monopoly over this advanced industry. Several editorials have likened these small electron chips to black gold for the crucial role it plays in the world today. Large corporations in the US and China depend on these chips to improve the productivity and efficiency of their products. When you think about it. Taiwan's current market dominance is what happens when you fully utilize your country's resources and have all the investments you need for advanced research. In the 60s, the United States held Taiwan's current position, producing roughly 65% of the world's semiconductors. During this era, American corporations like Texas Instruments, IBM, and RCA were household names in most parts of the world. But from the mid-80s, the US fought a fierce battle to retain its semiconductor monopoly, but eventually lost to Japan. As per a new strategy, the US began to invest in East Asian countries because they allowed American companies to scale productions with cheap labor costs and skilled workforces. It was a well-thought plan that lopsided Japan's dominance, even as their own economy began to crumble. Today, Taiwan is king and will remain so, as long as the People's Liberation Army of mainland China remains on their side of the geographical divide. The concept of one country, two systems doesn't sound new to many people. In the case of Taiwan and China, it means that both geographical locations will identify as one nation but answer to separate governments. From history, this is hardly even possible. But what pricks our curiosity is the fact that neither Taiwan nor China is ready to allow the other to undermine its sovereignty. Beijing sees the present Taiwan government and a large chunk of its citizens as separate separatists, or destroyers of peace in China's own words. This acrimony stems from the fact that Taiwan, officially called the Republic of China, is dominated by generations of Chinese citizens who migrated to the island in 1949 during the Chinese Civil War. When China's de facto government arrived on the island, they suppressed local resistance, renamed the island the Republic of China, and from its shores plotted an invasion of mainland China, which never happened. Mao Zedong's Communist Party assumed political authority in mainland China and reclaimed all diplomatic ties once accorded the de facto Republic of China in Taiwan. Today, the island maintains diplomatic ties with only 13 countries and is yet to be recognized as a country. However, one fact remains that Taiwan occupies a strategic geographical location that makes up what geopoliticians call the first island chain. 
On the north and south regions of Taiwan are waterways through which China can project its military forces into the Western Pacific Ocean, or in the event of an invasion, project its naval forces through to form a military barrier around Taiwan. To put it simply, the Chinese army can prevent the US and its allies from entering the China Sea in defense of Taiwan, specifically through the Bashi Channel to the south of Taiwan, just after the Philippines archipelago, and the Mikayo Strait to the north, which is closer to the Japan Islands. Moreover, these waterways could be critical choke points against China in the event of war with the US and its allies. Aside from military advantage, the Bashi Channel and the Miyako Strait are vital maritime trade routes to and from the China Sea. Hundreds of cargo ships enter and exit through these waterways daily, connecting the region with the economies of Southeast Asia, Oceania, and beyond. In addition, the Bashi Channel offers vital resources to Taiwan's fishing industry, another important sector in the island's economy. Annexing Taiwan will see China getting these economic benefits on a platter. Even more, China will inherit Taiwan's silent billion-dollar semiconductor industry. But at this point, you know this doesn't fall along the lines of the US strategy in the South Pacific. Agreeably, the US will feel much better knowing that the communist government of China can't get their hands on Taiwan's advanced microchips. So coming to Taiwan's defense is hardly debatable if an invasion does happen. When we think about past US interventions in places like Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq, it's important to consider the potential outcomes, both positive and negative. But what if US troops were to embark on a 90-day journey across the vast Pacific to aid Taiwan? Taiwan. It's a scenario that unavoidably raises the question of potential conflict with China. We've seen from the Russian war that a conflict of this scale will have far-reaching implications. Putin's war was strategized to last only three days. But here we are 24 months later, the world barely recovering from the energy crisis that erupted because of the war. But if China's provocative military drills and economic coercion against Taiwan do lead to an invasion, the island's prosperous economy, including China's and that of several parts of the world, will be gravely affected. Taiwan's economy is $760 billion strong. Being the world's 17th largest exporter of merchandise in 2022 is no small feat. GDP per capita was over $22,000, with the island's purchasing power parity equaling that of the Bahamas and South Korea. As of December 2022, Taiwan held one of the biggest foreign exchange reserves in the world. Given the island's geopolitical challenges, this is quite astonishing. Taiwan's success is linked to its connection with the US market and investment. In 2019, the U.S. invested $17.3 billion in Taiwan, and in 2020, exports from the U.S. to Taiwan were $8.9 billion. Currently, the U.S. is Taiwan's main source of military support against China. Economically, Taiwan is one of the few countries in the world that stood resilient against the global pandemic. Funny how the pandemic's hotspot was just next door. Even then, Taiwan exported billions of dollars worth of microchips to China year after year, thanks to the unparalleled strength of the Taiwanese semiconductor industry. In Western corridors, Taiwan is known for its advanced research and development capability, which is vital for developing products for advanced 5G telecommunication technology, AI, and the Internet of Things. Both foreign and Taiwanese investors regard the island as a crucial relocation alternative to protect themselves against the possibility of supply chain disruptions caused by regional trade frictions. However, Taiwan's economy has grown dependent on mainland China. The island's trade relations with China alone cover all trade deficits incurred with other countries. Although Taiwan has a few other ways of generating income, it is heavily hinged on its semiconductor industry. All its attempts for regional trade expansion via a new southbound policy have been stifled by China, plus low-level financial support from its own government. Through its new southbound policy, Taiwan aims to strengthen ties with Southeast Asian and South Asian nations, expanding its trade relationships beyond traditional markets. The Taiwanese government is also working to attract factory investments back to its shores, to at least reduce the level of economic dependence on China. While this initiative projects potential economic growth for the island, it really isn't the best decision at the moment. 
Political tensions hang in the air, and analysts have predicted that in the event of an invasion and possible war with China, Taiwan will lose roughly 10% of its GDP. A remedy to this grim forecast might be Taiwan's unofficial relationships with the US, Japan, South Korea, and the Philippines, which together make up for the island's low diplomatic ties and keep its economy afloat. Moreover, Taiwanese-owned companies are finding strategic locations elsewhere, some in faraway India, to break out of China's economic chokehold. Back on the mainland, Taiwanese businesses have strived to remain non-political in their dealings. However, the communist government is creating struggles for businesses it deems to be pro-independence or have political ties to the Democratic Progressive Party in Taiwan. China views many Taiwanese citizens as disruptors of peace. Well, the Democratic Progressive Party makes up a lot of these anti-peace agents. If you've been a regular watcher here at Economic Evolution, you'd already know that our analysis is never complete until we take you through an oversimplified version of history. The Taiwanese Identity before the Civil War, the Kuomintang Party KMT, ruled China. During the Chinese Civil War, the KMT lost control of the Communists, a defeat that upset the United States and still affects it today. After their retreat, the KMT and its followers fled to Taiwan. There, they continued to oppose the Communists but also suppressed local dissent. A notable dark moment was the February 28th incident, where the KMT brutally put down a local uprising. For 38 years following this, Taiwan was under martial law, with the KMT suppressing any opposition to its rule. After martial law ended, survivors and others formed the Democratic Progressive Party (DPP), pushing for a distinct Taiwanese identity, democracy, and closer ties with China. Now Taiwan's politics are divided mainly into three groups. The KMT, which wants to reunite with China on its terms, the DPP, which seeks an independent Taiwanese identity, and the those who prefer to keep things as they are. China supports the KMT, seeing it as more aligned with its interests and strongly opposes the DPP. China is particularly critical of Taiwan's President Lai ching te accusing him of being a threat to the peace, even though he has not pushed for formal independence from China. As an alternative to war, China has resorted to economic coercion to drive political decisions in Taiwan that favors the CCP. Coercion in this case doesn't mean military blockades or cyber attacks. Rather, Beijing will try to influence various Taiwanese stakeholders within and outside the island. They could achieve this through official government-to-government -government relationships or direct influence over any of the demographic groups that make up Taiwanese society. Basically, any business community that benefits from the cross-strait relationship and maintains an extensive relationship with the Chinese government would be a target. Also, diversified groups such as academics, trade unions, students, and government employees would be considered. Once China can disrupt the economic livelihoods of these sets of people, the CCP would expect these groups to pressure the Taiwanese government to effect policy changes or even concede to China's demands. The older generation, perhaps, might be able to maintain their stance on a Taiwanese identity, but the same cannot be said for the younger generation. Research has shown that a major fraction of these Taiwanese millennials are reluctant to pay the ultimate price if the need arises. Taiwan has a high percentage of college degree holders, even higher than the US. But one thing that has continually plagued this new breed of high achievers is that they hardly get a pay that is worth their academic efforts. Fresh Taiwanese college grads have to fend for themselves and pay off student loans by working multiple jobs. The talk about work-life balance will probably be a distasteful discussion. If China succeeds at influencing the livelihood of this particular demographic, given their towering predicaments, then your guess is as good as ours. But again, let's Let's give you a clearer example. In 2021, pineapple exports from Taiwan joined the list of tradable goods banned from mainland China. Before the announcement, China received nearly 100% of Taiwanese pineapple exports in an industry worth over $200 million per year, even if you factor in the global pandemic. 
Within a month, the price of pineapples dropped from 60 cents per 600 grams to a few pennies. Even worse, it couldn't be sold locally or to neighboring countries like Japan or Hong Kong because production quality became a serious issue. China made this call to sway public opinions concerning the January 2024 presidential election. Luckily for Taiwan, the attempt was futile. If China is serious about swaying the Taiwanese populace into some kind of reunification, then Hong Kong should have been a good reference point. But you see, China's relationship with Hong Kong has been recently fractured. Hong Kong once trusted the one country, two systems principle. Back in 1984, when China and the UK signed the Sino-British Joint Declaration, Britain promised to hand over Hong Kong to the People's Republic of China in 1997. And China, in turn, guaranteed that the economic and political systems of Hong Kong will remain unchanged for the next 50 years. The deal worked pretty fine until President Xi Jinping came into the picture. Under Xi's government, China witnessed a redirection of its domestic and foreign policy, with President Xi taking a more assertive approach in the global arena. Within a few years, the CCP began meddling with the politics of Hong Kong, promoting various unconstitutional tactics to decide which candidate was best suited for electoral offices. The CCP even went further in 2019 by introducing a bill that would have allowed the extradition of Hong Kong citizens with criminal charges to China. The bill, of course, met strong resistance in Hong Kong, with several protests and slogans calling for democracy. One of the biggest slogans during the protests was, Today is Hong Kong, tomorrow is Taiwan. A warning call to the geopolitical nightmare that is unveiling before our very eyes. To quell protests, China passed another law on safeguarding national security in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. Secession or breaking away from China became a criminal offense. Also, subversion or disregarding the authority of the central government and collusion with foreign and external forces were criminalized. Since the law became effective, Hundreds of protesters, activists, and former opposition lawmakers in Hong Kong have been arrested. China re-engineered Hong Kong's electoral system and set up a pro-China committee to screen political candidates based on their so-called patriotism. Hong Kong's betrayal is one bitter experience that has shaped the decisions that Taiwanese Democrats are making for their country. Time will fail to talk about numerous cases of intimidation and provocation involving the Communist Army, Navy, and Air Force against Taiwan. Several military drills have taken place near the Taiwan Strait, and the People's Liberation Army Air Force has conducted long-range drills not once, not twice, but multiple times across Taiwan's air defense identification zone, including the two crucial waterways, the Bashi Channel and the Miyako Strait. On one occasion causing the Japanese Japanese army to scramble fighter jets to intercept Chinese H-6K bomber aircraft. These provocations are part of China's grey zone tactics, aimed at weakening the country's adversary over a prolonged period. But in the bigger picture, China's three warfare strategy is what is really at play. This strategy involves employing media or public opinion warfare, psychological warfare, and media warfare to combat an enemy. So far, we've seen two of these strategies in full display, while a possibility of the third has got several international organizations on their toes. If Taiwan does declare independence, China is likely to roll out the big guns. But then again, a few analysts have been bold enough to say China may not invade after all. They believe the CCP will have a rethink about sacrificing its economic success for a costly regional war. The most it can do is to continue to limit Taiwan's entry into regional trade agreements and take their acts of provocation to a new level. Taiwan faces a formidable challenge ahead. Lai ching te may have won the presidential election, but his party, the DPP, couldn't secure enough seats in the legislative. President Ching Tae will see his policies being torn apart by the opposition parties. Even the release of government funds will be a hard nut to crack. 
Ching Te's government will probably focus on establishing newer informal relationships since it's a formula that has worked before. Sure enough, Taiwanese companies like Foxconn and its semiconductor giant TSMC have begun making major investments in India, the United States, and Japan. The Biden administration, for instance, included Taiwan, alongside Japan and South Korea in the Chip4 alliance, which is aimed at ensuring a more secure semiconductor supply chain through democratic and multi lateral relations. Another profitable path for Taiwan would be diversifying its portfolio. The semiconductor industry has been the major flagship of economic success for a long time, maybe too long. Taiwan needs to allow other industries an opportunity to outshine themselves, although the costs of doing so might be a little steep. But on the bright side, Taiwan would have made profitable long-term investments for its economy. In addition, getting a couple extra foreign portfolios into the country will be a major boost to the economy. High-paying industries will encourage the millennials to settle in Taiwan and eventually fight for its sovereignty. Perhaps the chances of Chinese invasion might be limited as a result. The only laws that might prevent Taiwan from emerging as a global superpower will be the ones the island sets for itself. There's no limit to what Taiwan can achieve if it expertly maneuvers China's political attacks. Even if China refuses to call off its bluff, Ukraine's resilience in the Russian war has made us see that strong leadership and a cohesive policy can stand against foreign invasion. Hopefully, Taiwan has learned enough to survive. What are your thoughts on Taiwan's economic and political challenges? Share your thoughts in the comments below, and remember to subscribe for more insightful content.